take the plunge in these Micronesian waters and you enter an alien world, pulsating with life. Here you can swim through a milky way of jellyfish and emerge unscathed. This is just one of the wonders of Palau. A collection of hundreds of small islands strung across the Pacific due east of the Philippines and home to some of the best diving on the planet. Palau is a tiny nation with big ambitions. Five years ago, it became the first country in the world to introduce a shark sanctuary. Now, there are 10 of them. But the president wants to take it one step further. He wants to ban all foreign commercial fishing in Palau's waters. Only bold action, he says, can save the Pacific's collapsing tuna stocks and guarantee Palau's way of life. Palau is so fragile and it is so beautiful that you, you just have to take the responsible uh, action and minimize the risk that would destroy all of this for our children and future children. The president's plan is far-sighted, but also risky as foreign fishing provides a big chunk of Palau's income. But the shark sanctuary has shown that conserving sea life, rather than killing it, can pay off. Ecotourism is far and away Palau's main money earner. Well, this is the uh, latest boom industry for Palau snorkeling tours for Japanese and Chinese tourists and as you can see there's a lot of them. More than 100,000 tourists visit each year. That's five holiday makers for every citizen. This is the draw card. A close encounter with the reef's residents, among them wrasse, turtles, and sharks. There's no baiting or feeding to lure the sharks. Here, any meeting is on their terms. So white tips, black tips. White tips. Black tip, grey reef shark. Mm. They were the three sharks that we saw. Yeah. Do you ever see hammerheads or? Yeah, they're the big ones and they're the, the top trumps. If you see them, you're yeah. extremely lucky. Um, but we do get them around here. Thank you. Divers are prepared to pay a premium for an experience they haven't found elsewhere. It's funny, when you're not expecting sharks to be around, you have this innate fear of them, but when they are actually swimming around you and you're in their environment, you don't feel threatened and it's just really cool. We were in the Maldives two weeks ago and one of their big dives, Paradio Express, we didn't see anywhere near as many sharks as we see here in Palau. I come from Hong Kong and one of the delicacies is sharks in soup and it's really quite disgusting that they're still doing that now. Sharks are they're, they're endangered now. You've just got to be a bit careful and just not eat them. These photos show the gruesome reality in Palau just over a decade ago. Foreign longline fishing boats hunted sharks for the Asian market, hacking off their fins even while the animals were alive. Yeah, well, this was a foreign fishing base uh, full of, you know, long liners uh, with shark fins hanging in the rigging. And Dive shop manager Dermot Keane was one of the activists who fought to end the brutal business of shark finning. We had a running battle with these guys next door. Sometimes it escalated into stone throwing and at one point going over with knives and cutting out the shark fins out of the rigging. 
and uh, throwing them over the side and trying to get it through these guys' heads, you know, just exactly what was going on. His push for a shark sanctuary made him a target for death threats. There was a lot of opposition. I mean, the, the fishing companies were very, very powerful and very, very prominent. Ultimately, the argument that sharks are worth more alive than dead won out. Palau banned the commercial harvesting of any shark in its exclusive economic zone, an area bigger than France. Many other countries inspired to follow us. I mean, it's just a small, small little country, but uh, we are a beacon for shark conservation and marine conservation around the world. Just 21,000 people live in Palau, most of them here in Karoo. It's the main tourist hub and commercial heart of the country. Palauans are well off by Pacific standards. They have land to farm and fish to eat. And the president wants to keep it that way. And do you um, worry in terms of developing the tourism more that you might ruin the environment? Yeah, I think we have to be careful that we don't have uh, more boats than fish uh, <laughs> down there. You know, president Tommy Remengasau Jr. was a key driver of the shark sanctuary. I first met him during a foreign correspondent shoot 19 years ago. Now the issue uh, that everybody sees and talks about is where do we go from here? Palau was newly independent and the then vice president told me the fledgling nation didn't want to become another high-rise Hawaii. How should our future look like? Uh, do, we, do we want to look like Guam and Saipan? Do we want to look like Hawaii? Or do, is there another way that Palau can look like Palau? 20 years on, how is Palau faring and is this the kind of Palau you were thinking of back then? Well, <clears throat> certainly it's not Hawaii, still. Uh, we have a long way to go before we become uh, like the great state of Hawaii. Would you like to be like Hawaii? Uh, no, because I, I said it then and I'm saying it now. I, I think we all have our different tastes and uh, different priorities and aspirations. For this president, the priority is food security, having fish into the future. There's a lot of squids that come to this place. Oh, really? So we used to come before the hotel was built. Uh, and uh, that's so why he wants to ban all squid. foreign fishing within Palau's 200 nautical mile boundary. Oh! We have to take drastic steps. Uh, um, there are species of uh, uh, bluefin and species of uh, uh, big eye tuna that are dangerously close to being becoming uh, unsustainable. Uh, and so those are the hard facts that we have to look at. Tuna is big business in Palau. The export taxes and access fees paid by foreign fishing companies provide the country's largest earnings after tourism. Most of the catch is landed by the Taiwanese and Japanese fishing fleets and is processed by three Karoo based exporters. This is one of the private companies that has an agreement with the government of Palau to conduct tuna fisheries and they're offloading their catches here. And as you can see, the catches are primarily big eye and yellowfin, ranging from an average uh, weight of about 25 kilos up to 70 kilos. The highest grade fish are air freighted to Japan. Within a couple of days, most of this haul will be expensive sashimi in Tokyo. Tuna which doesn't make the cut is left on the ground for local suppliers and restaurateurs to fight over. Nanette Malsol oversees the management of Palau's ocean fisheries. Her staff inspect every fish which comes ashore. So we have two from our office, one collecting data on the weight and the species 
and another collecting data on the length, and that's specifically used for, for science purposes. Figures from Palau and across the Western and Central Pacific reveal a fishery in crisis. Big Eye tuna is now officially overfished and yellowfin is heading that way. Big Eye is becoming threatened and so we have to start taking care of the Big Eye. The yellowfin, not so much. But enough to warrant urgent action. Yellowfin tuna is down to about 38% of its original biomass. Big eye tuna is down now to about 16%. So in any sense, in a well-managed fishery, it actually stopped fishing on that and begin to rebuild the stocks. Professor Glenn Hurry heads the commission charged with conserving and managing migratory fish in the Western and Central Pacific. He says the yellowfin catch must be reduced and the harvesting of big eye tuna stopped if the planet's last great fishery is to survive. As for bluefin tuna, it's faring even worse, down to just 4% of its original population. I just think we've got too many vessels in there fishing these fish at the moment and we really need to reduce the pressure and the catch on them. Whether we can do it and whether we can do it quick enough to arrest any further decline is really going to be a challenge for the Commission. The number of fishing boats in the Western and Central Pacific is increasing, 300 at last count. They're deploying fish aggregating devices, fads such as this one recorded by Greenpeace. Even simple structures can attract a school of fish and when combined with sophisticated technology, tuna don't stand a chance. They've now got um, sonar buoys that you put on the um, fish aggregating devices. So you can actually sit in your office in, in a comfortable chair somewhere and you can look up through the satellite and get a, a good idea of the volume of fish underneath each of the fish aggregating devices that you've got out on the ocean and you can direct your vessels to go and fish fish fad 9, fish fad 16 and then fish fad 8. So the catching power of the vessels has actually increased enormously as technology has improved over the last five or six years. The unfortunate truth right now is uh, with f modern fishing technology, a uh, school of fish is uh, actually a, a captured school in its entirety. President Remengasal's plan to ban foreign fishing is aimed at giving fish a fighting chance. Palau wants to maximise whatever we can do, uh, not just for our own uh, uh, interest, but because the fish is migratory, we would be doing our share of ensuring that the stock, when they come through Palau, it's like a rest area or a, a replenish area. Isn't that going to be hard to sustain given the enforcement problems? Very difficult and I think that's the reality that we're also facing, the challenge of how do we enforce what is in on, on paper. I'm about to get a taste of what Palau's marine law enforcement officers are up against. PSS President Remelik is being readied for sea. The Pacific-class patrol boat, provided by Australia, is Palau's main weapon against illegal fishing. But it's not as effective as it could be. I reckon we have managed to catch around about 10% of, of the vessels operating illegally, mainly through uh, our inability to maintain a secure uh, operation at any time and our inability to provide air surveillance uh, to catch these guys. What we're looking at is uh, the Google Earth picture. You can see a distinctive pattern from a vessel. Lieutenant Commander Alan Wilmore from the Royal Australian Navy is Palau's maritime surveillance advisor. Uh, this one up here, he's just loitering on the line. Uh, so we may be interested in this guy. Each fishing boat is required to carry okay, a monitoring so system, uh, allowing authorities to track its system. movements. So Ships which before, come up uh, green are clean. Yellow means they've breached their licence before. 
and then we have red, which are, which are the bad guys, which we are most interested in. Identifying suspicious behaviour is not difficult, but catching offenders red-handed is. It's catching them either in the act or catching them with a product on board. Uh, these vessels already have the word that Remlick is out and about. Now they'll either ditch the product over the side or transship it to another vessel. So that's the problem. It's a high seas game of cat and mouse, but it's the only option these marine police have. In their sights on this journey is a fishing boat about 130 kilometres offshore. Well, it looks like pretty perfect weather. Yeah, it is. Is it often like this? No, uh, last week was a rough uh, weather, now it's getting cold. The Remelec goes on patrol only once or twice a month. The cost of fuel makes it an expensive operation. $50,000 for a nine-day voyage with no guarantee of success. But for the ship's electrician, Jim Klulichard, every trip is worthwhile. I grew up as a fisherman. I spent a lot of my time in the water. And to grow up and work in the Remelec, Protecting our war is everything to me. Officer Klulichad was a coral researcher and then an official observer on longline fishing boats. He was horrified by how many sharks, rays and other bycatch were hooked. It's one of the reasons he joined the Remelik. I'd rather be on the police line that where I can tell them to stop. Because being an observer, you're just recording the data. You don't have any power to stop people from doing what they're doing. It's just after dawn and the Remelik has found its target, a Taiwanese flagged longliner. This is Palau Police, request to the board on your vessel. It's a routine inspection, but the officers are armed. The Western and Central Pacific fishery is worth $6 billion a year. There's a lot at stake. At 26 metres long, the Fure Man Chun No. 56 is a pretty standard longliner. It's Taiwanese owned but crewed by Indonesians. How are you? Good. The captain says they've been at sea for three weeks, feeding out hooked lines which stretch as far as 50 kilometres. Jim, what are you doing here? Now we're in uh, checking their catch and make sure they um, match their fish lock they have. Then we also want to identify what species of fish they have, like this one and the sizes and then the condition. Yeah. And so far is it matching? Yeah, yeah, so far it's matching, but see the thing is they, they use a water cooler instead of frozen, so we can't really go inside and then pull all of this out, so we're going to destroy the, the texture of the meat. Squid, squid. After searching the ship, the boarding party finds no evidence of illegal fishing. The crew members are left to tend to their lines. And we return to the Remelec to go looking for a bamboo raft which the crew spotted earlier. It's a fad, a fish aggregating device, and Captain Albert Yangoamau plans to destroy it. So it's likely that this has been set by a boat which will be coming back to uh, set a net around it? Yes. Do you find many of them? Yeah, most of the time. Every trip we go out, we sink, we destroy some bugs. The raft is well made and hard to break up, 
so the crew douse it with fuel. It's a long process, and as we head back to port, the burnt shell is still bobbing on the waves. There's no doubting the dedication of the crew of the Remelec. But this is just one ship patrolling a vast Palawan sea, which at any given time has 40 or 50 fishing boats in it. And of those, at least a few would almost certainly have convictions for prior fishing violations. As far as Officer Klulichud is concerned, the sooner Palau adopts the President's plan to ban foreign fishing, the better. He's worried not just about the longliners, but the purse seiners, which use circular nets to ensnare and scoop up huge quantities of tuna. If the purse seiner is getting all the juvenile and all these longline fishing boats that are getting the adult ones, I mean, who's, who is left behind? I mean, who has the power to eliminate any fish in the water? We're talking about a three to five year period. Um, so five years from now, you would hope that there's no foreign That's fishing. the whole idea, that we want to work on our legislation to address that. Mm. But the president is likely to face a fight, and not just from the foreign fishing fleets. The foreign fishing industry has some powerful friends here, including a former Palawan president who now heads up one of the three large seafood export companies. His family's businesses also lease the land that the port sits on and run security both here and at the airport. Palau's 16 state governments rely heavily on their cut of the $5 million in national fishing revenue. They won't want to give that up without a guaranteed alternative. The president says an expanded tourism industry will plug any financial gaps and will provide far greater returns for Palau than a tuna industry geared to benefit foreign interests over Pacific nations. 94% of the total value of the tuna is realised by the, by the outside industry and only 6% actually is returned to the local governments and to the people who are the resource owners. Part of the president's plan is to build a domestic commercial fishing industry with access to one-fifth of Palau's waters. What it will do also is lessen the stress on the reef uh, because we also see that with uh, the growing population of tourists and our own food security, the reef are really stressed out to the max. The region's fishery boss applauds Palau's commitment to sustainability, but says it won't save the tuna industry. That can be salvaged only if all Pacific countries and fishing nations agree to cut the catch. They meet in December. You're better off making a, a decision now that's a bit tough and a bit unpalatable than make one in a, in a disaster scenario in maybe three or five years' time. Fishing is a way of life for Palauans. When Marine Policeman Jim Klulichard is not on the Remelik, he's out casting a net or line with his son, Oriel. You got some? Keep going to the... all the way there. When I'm not on the boat and I'm here, Keep I'm going. teaching my son the basic way of fishing. You only get okay. what you're going to eat. OK, now let's go fishing. With bait in hand, they're off to hook a meal. It's something that I gotta teach my son why we're doing it, why we're doing this conservation thing. Like fishermen the world over, Officer Klulichard says it's getting harder to land a catch. He's hoping that will change once a foreign fishing ban is in place. When we were little, 
there's, uh, there's a, like during the summertime, we get to see a big school of tuna coming past, passing the island, and they're really close. So we can take this boat and then we go and then we troll for the big ones. No, it doesn't really, it doesn't happen like that. At the grand age of 11, even Oriole says he's seen a change. Well, there used to be a lot of fish here when I was young, but now they're running out faster. Ooh. But he's got a bite today. Oh, that's a coral trout, man. That's a good fish. A good fish caught at a bad time, spawning season. So it's released. They're having a baby now, so we cannot collect them. It's all in conservation. Yeah, throw it back in the water. Palau is nothing without its ocean. That's why it's trying to conserve as much sea life as possible. The country led the way on shark preservation. And the president wants to do the same for sustainable fishing. As a keen spearfisher, he has a vested interest. When you're finally through with being president, how are you going to spend your days? I'm going to truly be a full-time fisherman. Uh, so I won't continue to claim that I'll be a fisherman, but I'll actually be a prove, uh, truly a, a living and practicing fisherman. I think you said that last time we met, nearly 20 years ago. Yeah, Is it I'm ever going to happen? I'm, I'm still uh, trying to get there. <laughs>